Good morning, everybody. Hey, y'all. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Bienvenue. Okay, so the English hello didn't work. The southern U.S. hello didn't work, but the French one did. That's a good sign. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Hi. It is an absolute pleasure to join you here today at the Technology and Education Seminar and Showcase for 2023. J'ai l'honneur de passer ces deux jours avec vous à la séminaire et la vitrine sur l'éducation et les technologies 2023. And before we start, I will signal for those of you who are physically with us here today that in the event of a fire or emergency, we'll be directed by the on-site team here at the Global Mail Center. And should we need to evacuate this space, you'll be directed to one of the two exit routes near the elevator lobby. To open our time together this morning, it's an honor to introduce you to Elder Wabagoon. Elder Wabagoon is an Ojibwe elder who sits with the Loon clan. She is a member of the Obish Kokong and the Lak Sul First Nation. She is a keeper of sacred pipes, a writer, a speaker, a land defender, and water protector, and has lived in Toronto for 45 years. Her grandmother, of Petawewe lineage, was a medicine woman. Her mother of Safe lineage was an Indian residential school survivor. And Elder Wabagoon herself, also of Safe lineage, is a 60s scoop survivor. In April 2023, Elder Wabagoon was appointed First People's Leadership Advisor to the General Manager of Transportation Services with the City of Toronto. This Indigenous advisory role is the first of its kind for the city, and the partnership is designed to create a continuous, long-term relationship with the First Peoples of this land, one based on truth, honor, deep trust, and respect. She also has an extensive experience with Street Art Toronto and is the co-founder and co-lead of the youth program, Nikibi Doadina Gigwag. She advocates for the voice of youth to be heard and to be honored, to shape their future roles as caretakers of Mother Earth. Please give me an opportunity to join you in a generous welcome for Elder Wabagoon. Anin and the Wemagana dog. Bonjour. Nakomas Wabagoon, flower blooming in spring, and deep to trust. Obisha Kokang, Laksua First Nation, Treaty 3 Territory, Minwa, Toronto. Nangdodam. What I said was an Ojibwe protocol greeting, and I said, hello, all my relations, and welcome. My name is Wabagoon, flower blooming in spring. I'm from Obisha Kokang. The narrow is abundant with white pine. Laksua First Nation, Treaty 3 Territory, and I sit with the Loon Clan. I'd like to say Chi Miigwech to eCampus Ontario team for inviting me to this awesome event once again. Miigwech to uh, Jason Northway Frank for offering me the gift of tobacco. It's my honor to accept this gift as tobacco is sacred and it's one of the first of the four sacred medicines and the first medicine that Creator gave to the Anishinaabe people. Most times, tobacco is offered when the request to open an event is first made. But I wanted to share this protocol with you today so that when you have an opportunity to offer tobacco to a First Nations elder, you'll have an idea of where to start. If we want to start this path of reconciliation, let us share, come together as one. Miigwech for the gift of tobacco, Jason. So whenever we gather, we want to open a beautiful space such as this. We want to open it in a good way. We want to face, fill this space with ease and balance, good words, good direction, and come together as one. 
Normally, I would open a space, to open a space, I would smudge the space with sage smoke. And perhaps some of you have seen that before, but today we'll be opening with sacred medicine water. I chose water to open this event so that everyone would have access to this medicine for days. I'd like you to recognize the sacred water by saying miigwech, by saying thank you the next time you take a drink of water, or perhaps it's later this evening when you're doing the dishes or when you're showering or making that last cup of tea. For water is sacred, water is life. I brought with me this morning a mixture of cedar, water, and the cedar is gifted to me from the treated tree that sit by the shores of uh, British Columbia. And sacred medicine stones from the Bulkley and the Skeena rivers where they meet at the Great Sasan, also in British Columbia. It is called Mushkiti Nibe, medicine water. I share it with you now and with the space. And with this beautiful sacred water that is close by, if you get a chance on your break, go outside and say hello to the water. Water is alive. Water is filled with emotion and knows you as a sacred part of creation. So please say hello. I share uh, this medicine water to show gratitude to all the things the creator has provided us with. And we want to say miigwech to Mother Earth and all that came before us, the creator. The elements, the green nation, the trees, the plants, the winged ones, the swimmers, the crawlers, and the four-legged. They all came before us with their original instructions to provide medicine, food, warmth, and hydration for all that we, the two-legged, would need. That was their original instruction. So as I sing this song to open the space, I ask that everybody think about <coughs> all that you are grateful for. And in your mind, say which for the land that you walk upon, the water so sacred, the colorful trees letting go of their leaves, showing us that letting go is okay. The animals preparing for the long fast over the winter. The crisp wind that refreshes your face as you walk home. And while we sit under the 11th moon of creation, Mushka Gizis, look up from your, from your technology for the star nation is sitting closest to us during this moon, making it brighter in the evening and bringing us closer to our ancestors, to your ancestors, to your ancestors, to your ancestors. They're all very close at this time. So talk to them. Say something to them. Say, I love you. Say, I miss you. Say kind and gentle words to them. I ask all those who are able to, able to, to please stand and face the eastern direction as I sing the calling of the four direction song. With each small verse, we'll turn to our right and face the southern direction, then the western direction, and so on. If you're unable to stand, please remain seated. Close your eyes. We have
pastor in direction? Just tell me now. <laughs> Way high. And I just ask you to uh, uh, bow your head as I sing to the northern direction. And I'll explain to you why in just a second, why I've done it this way. Way high. Today was a different day when I woke up. Today somebody passed in our family, and the reason I asked you to sit uh, was when I faced the north. I was asking my ancestors to accept uh, our niece into their arms. And I wanted to sing that song as their great-granddaughter. Those are my ancestors, and I asked them to welcome her. And I say a prayer for my husband. And I say, make wish to you for joining in the ceremony. So it's with this song, the Mashkatini Be, my words that invite peace and calm into the space. Let us remember the tranquility of silence, the sounds of loons on the lake and the water lapping up on the shores. Take a moment and touch our sacred mother earth and say, make wish. Take a moment to be still with the water and with yourself. And live the less lesson of living in harmony as one with all our relations. For we are all connected. I say miigwech as I honor those who came before me. And I say miigwech as I welcome you all to the space. Thank you very much for listening. Miigwech. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Elder Wabadoon, for such a moving welcome to uh, this year's annual conference. And uh, please accept my condolences and the condolences of everybody else here for the loss in your family. I know it's not easy to deal with. Um, so we're gathered here today on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. This is now home to many diverse First Nations, Iwi and Métis. It's important for us to acknowledge our relationship to the land and those who have come here before us. It's a very important aspect of, our, of recognizing our responsibilities under the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. Last year in my opening remarks, I talked a little bit about how we're all treaty people, uh, which Elder Wabagoon also um, was mentioning uh, that we're on uh, Treaty 3 territory. Uh, but I learned a couple of weeks ago that this is actually uh, not true for everybody in Canada. I was at the Indigenous Education Symposium that was sponsored by the Indigenous uh, Institute Consortium and Colleges and Institutes Canada, 
And uh, Corey Wilson, who's the director, or sorry, executive director of indigenous education for the British Columbia Institute of Technology, BCIT, uh, was one of the speakers at this event. And she told the audience that um, there's many nations, mostly in British Columbia, that uh, don't live with a, a treaty relationship with the government. Uh, so in fact, we're not all treaty people. And in fact, that there are many uh, indigenous people who have been forcibly disenfranchised uh, from their rights as people, much less as uh, treaty people. Uh, so I learned that recently, so, and I thought I would share that because um, it's, well, it's emblematic of what we're here to do in terms of learn, uh, but it's also important because uh, you know, recognizing the, the, uh, the moment of reconciliation means understanding that there's many aspects to the truth of colonization and that we all have a responsibility to continue to learn how we can be better people within the, the uh, for within the future. So welcome everybody to this year's edition of the Technology and Education Seminar and Showcase, or TESS. I'm Robert Luke, I'm the CEO of eCampus Ontario, and I'm really pleased to welcome you all. Uh, my job is to serve and support all of our institutions, of which there are 56, and all of the people that work uh, for eCampus Ontario, which is about 80 or so. So it's a busy job. Uh, since about 2015, well, not about, actually since 2015, eCampus Ontario has been convening this uh, conference to gather the, the leaders in post-secondary education to think about how we can co-design the future of the, the provincial digital learning ecosystem. This year is no, uh, no exception. I'll take a moment to acknowledge a few people in the room. Uh, we have Deputy Minister David Way from Ministry of Colleges and Universities who's going to be coming to speak after me. Uh, so thank you very much, Deputy, for being here. Uh, you've just met Elder Wabagoon. Uh, thank you, Elder. Uh, Chris McGrath uh, and I just met for the first time in person. We, here's a pro tip. We both used to work at George Brown College, so I recognize the Take 5 for safety uh, at the start of this. So thank you for that. Um, also, Anne-Marie Vaughn, President of uh, Humber College, uh, who's also co-chair of the board of eCampus Ontario. Uh, Trisha Williams is here from the Future Skills Centre. Uh, there's many other people here, uh, Maxine Jean-Louis from Contact North. Um, these are all leaders in the system who I would encourage you to uh, seek out and, and uh, bend their ear about what's important uh, to you because uh, they're, the, they're the people who will be able to listen and help co-create the kind of solutions that we, that we all need. So all of you are great partners in helping eCampus Ontario to convene the sector and envision the future of the, the, uh, what it means to thrive in the digital world. Uh, I would also like to thank our sponsors for, the, for this event, present at our first ever vendor showcase, our CDP Communications, who specialize in accessibility, Crowdmark, who actually wins the prize for best logo of the day that I've seen so far, I know it's early, uh, and WooClap. WooClap, I like your, your logo too, but uh, just saying. Um, please visit the booths in the main hall uh, and talk to them because they have some really interesting things to offer. Uh, we're also sponsored by Coru Coaching and Education, as well as Voice Ed Radio, who, whom you'll find uh, podcasting in the vendor showcase. And if you're like me, you might have listened to one or two of the podcasts uh, in advance of today's event. <coughs> Last but not least, I want to acknowledge the support of the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, who's our primary sponsor for everything that we do. Thank you all for your support. So this year, we're exploring the digitally empowered learner and how technology can open new doors to the knowledge and skills learners need to achieve the future that they imagine. In supporting the digitally empowered learner, we are creating not just the future of learning, but the future of work. This is also the future of social interaction and the future of civic engagement. Supporting the digitally empowered learner is about so much more than online learning. It's about how we use all of the technologies that permeate almost every aspect of our lives today. And importantly, it means ensuring that we put humans, that we put people at the center of designing of any technology. And so we invite you to ask, how do we prepare our learners to be literate in the use of today's technologies and those that will come tomorrow? How do we ensure that people have the necessary digital fluency to thrive in their careers and in society? And perhaps more fundamentally, what is digital empowerment? What does this mean for our learners? What does it mean for our institutions? And if we're all learners, what does it mean for us? 
Let's consider artificial intelligence. Our keynote speaker tomorrow will argue for preserving participatory learning experiences as a counterpart to automated outputs. And this is an important point. Humans, engagement and experiences are at the center of learning. We are the humans in the loop that can and should be directing the use of AI to ensure that the experience of learning is much more than mere access to content. And it's worth noting that AI works because it regresses to the mean, it uses the average, and it uses the average of the data that it finds on the internet, which we know is imperfect and full of biases. So it's really, really important for us to interrogate what the use of AI is and how it's going to be deployed, particularly when it's deployed against systems, learning, banking, finance, immigration, that prevent us from really understanding how the decisions are being taken. So AI is just the latest and most current and seemingly most disruptive new technology. There are many more technologies on the horizon that will continue to challenge us. Technological change has always been a fact. I would say that it's really just the pace of that change that is new and it's accelerating and it can be overwhelming. Dealing with these changes productively is why digital fluency and digital empowerment are so important. In many respects, digital fluency is the lingua franca of learning. This is about learning how to learn, learning how technology works, learning with technology or through any media, and it's learning how to learn with other people, and this is empowering. We all share one technology that enables events like this to happen. This is the technology of language, or maybe more appropriately, the technology of languages. Language is how we engage and interact with others. It's the very foundation of learning, and it's part of what makes us human. Humans are not the only species that, have a lang uh, that share language, of course. I've just been reading a great book on birds and the language that they speak, and some of the birds are smarter than some of my family members, it would appear. J'ai utilisé l'intelligence artificielle pour m'aider à traduire cette partie de mon discours, mais surtout j'ai travaillé avec ma colleague francophone Andrea Krasna. Is Andrea here? I didn't see Andrea. She's right there. Thank you. Um, pour m'assurer que ma prononciation et le choix de mots étaient correct. Cela renforce le besoin de conserver l'élément humain dans nos conversations sur la technologie et l'éducation. Side note, I've been working to improve my French. I've been greatly aided by my colleagues. Actually, most of our Francophone colleagues are sitting right here. Cyril, Marie-Claire, Andrea, of course. I would encourage you to come and talk to them in any language. I grew up in Saskatchewan, which is not known as a bastion of French language. So thank you very much for your patience and your counsel. The point here is that technology is certainly useful in many situations. It was for me when I wanted to do some translation. But we need people and engagement to support digital empowerment. You can let me know how I did later. Talking and engaging with others at events like this is essential for sharing ideas and learning what works, what doesn't, and how we can leverage our collective insight to benefit learners. Case in point, just yesterday, we convened a pre-conference workshop on how we can work together as a sector to better support international learners. Discussion focused on how the sector can provide digital options for helping international learners to thrive. I encourage you to visit the eCampus Ontario booth, which is right up here in the hallway, and pick up one of the summaries of the work uh, of the, of the uh, results of some of the learner, inf uh, learner research that our research and foresight team has done. This work was led by Alex Hughes. Is Alex here today? He's right over there. Um, exemplary work that has some exceptional insights, some of which are maybe obvious, uh, but uh, are important for us to learn from as we try to stand up better systems to help not just international learners, but all learners to thrive. And it was through discussion and engagement that we were able to convene representatives for our Indigenous Institutes, from our colleges and our universities to figure out, well, what can we do to work together to help these learners have a better experience before they come here, when they are here, and as they, if they choose to, take up permanent residency and ultimately citizenship. 
At TEST this year, we're going to be talking a lot about work integrated learning. We're going to be talking about AR and VR, about learning with open educational resources, and other digital learning trends. Throughout these discussions, let's focus on how we can promote digital fluency and digital empowerment. Let's focus on how we can work together to ensure that people can learn and work with any technology, that they can use any media to be an engaged learner and a productive citizen. Let's focus on how we can enhance, enhance the human in the loop of learning. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that there's a photo booth outside. <laughs> Where's Lufia? Lufia's not here. She's in the photo booth. <laughs> Lufia and I got our photo taken. You can't really believe everything you say. Lufia and I are actually the same height in, this, uh, uh, in these photos, which is now true. Um, so I encourage you to go out there and uh, take some photos and uh, share them. There's a hashtag that you can use, hashtag test2023, uh, so you can share these. I think you're going to have to take a picture of the picture in order to share these on your social media platform of choice, but I think you get that already. Thank you. Um, moving along. Uh, and now I would like to uh, hand things over to Ontario's Deputy Minister for Colleges and Universities, David Way. David became Deputy Minister about five months ago, I believe, after holding the same position at Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Over an extensive career, he has held a number of senior positions in the Ontario Public Service. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet David on a couple of occasions. I know him to be an incredibly uh, smart and interesting and interested person in what we are here to talk about today. So, Deputy, welcome to your first test. I am not the same height as Robert, so uh, I'll have to. Uh, so thank you and good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's great to be here, as Robert uh, as Robert said. It's my first time at TESS. It's uh, it's great to see. It's quite incredible, quite frankly, to see so many people driving advancements in digital learning. Um, the work you're doing, I've seen a lot of the work that you do. The work you're doing is is individually and collectively really driving major impact on our learners, and that's you know to Robert's point around the people. It's really about driving uh, advancements to help our learners and help the people of Ontario uh, grow and, and achieve what they need to achieve uh, uh, from their life. Uh, today's students have really benefited and are really accu accustomed to some of the online information and services, some of the immersive ser experiences and other innovative um, experiences uh, that we brought that the collective group here and others have brought forward. So it's really fitting this conference is, is entitled Supporting the Digitally Empowered Learner. On our part, the Ontario government continues to build on our foundation of the virtual learning strategy to ensure benefits to all learners, and always that, that learner focus remains a top priority. priority. Uh, since the strategy was introduced in 2020, its three pillars have worked together, supporting the sector and driving high quality, innovative, hybrid learning experiences for students. Secondly, to prepare lifelong learners for the needs of the ever-changing economy. And third, positioning Ontario as a global leader and test bed for digital innovation in educational technology. I'd like to thank Robert and eCampus Ontario for being a key implementation partner for the virtual learning strategy and your continued efforts to expand the quality and access of hybrid learning across Ontario. So thank you. Over the last five months in my role uh, at MCU, I've been really lucky enough to hear some really some powerful and really personally impactful uh, virtual learning stories that exemplify each of those three pillars. For example, some incredible work is coming out of the post-secondary education sector to harness transformative technology and deliver immersive experiential learning to today's learners. When I visited in the Indigenous Institute in Thunder Bay, Oshki Wenjak, recently, they demonstrated an immersive augmented reality, virtual reality room, where they are instructing students on different situations as part of a police foundations course. The technology presented students with a range of challenging real-world situations, and it was really easy to see the benefits in experiencing those situations in such a realistic environment, and learning how to handle them, when to confront, when to de-escalate. Uh, I was able to try it myself, and, and of course, as someone who hates confrontation, failed miserably at it, but it was a great experience, uh, and really, you could see how making mistakes, you know, people making mistakes, but then learning and discussing 
from that experience, from their instructors, how to be better and how to learn. And it was a fantastic opportunity to see those technologies in action. For me, it was a powerful lesson on the impact of these technologies. As I've come into the role at MCU, I've ensured that we as a ministry and collectively the sector always keeps that learner front and center when it comes to advancements in digital learning. That's why I was happy to see digital balance as one of the four guiding principles of today's conference. Uh, although hybrid learning provides new incredible uh, opportunities to access post-secondary education, we can't ignore some of the basic challenges that still face certain learners. Contact North and Maxim and I go way back, but uh, Contact North is doing some incredible work in this space, reducing economic and technological barriers for learners across Ontario, particularly in those remote northern rural areas where there is uh, challenges around access. I had the pleasure of visiting with Contact North recently. I was able to talk to some other learners who have benefited from the work that Contact North does. All these individuals were coming from remote communities. We called into from remote communities, so the full virtual experience. But it was particularly imp impactful to hear from a woman who'd lived in a remote community in the north, uh, which did not have a local uh, uh, post-secondary institution, had struggled with a disability, and was unable to kind of return to her pre previous work. She had limited post-secondary education, and, there's, and there was, uh, was really having difficulties re-engaging in new work opportunities in her local economy. By finding Contact North, she was able to start her path back into the workforce and was on a path to enrolling in a personal support worker program. It was really inspiring to see the tangible results of how digital technologies are meeting students in their communities and helping them on their own learning journeys. And especially in this case, because as we know in today's economy, a modern worker must always be a lifelong learner, uh, a lifelong learner and, and achieve their highest potential they need to access those modern tools and technologies to constantly retool and develop new skills needed for the jobs of the future. So thank you all, all of you in this room. Uh, you're an important part of seeing the impact that you have on individuals and individual learners. And I encourage you all to continue to innovate and push the boundaries of how we can best serve Ontario learners at all stages of their career. With that, I'll close my remarks and wish everyone a wonderful conference and thank you. Deputy. I'm pleased to now introduce the co-chairs of the eCampus Ontario Board of Directors. Stephen Murphy, the President and Vice Chancellor of Ontario Tech University, and Anne-Marie Vaughan, President and CEO of Humber College. It's so important to talk about learning in a digital context. It's so important. GPD Vortex. Um, and that said, I will invite uh, Anne Marie Vaughan, the president and CEO of Humber College, to join us here today. Thanks. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everyone. I am so pleased to join my colleagues and welcome you all to TESS 2023. And I do get hope we get to hear from Stephen Murphy. He's an uh, exceptional co-chair 
and I have to say I enjoy every moment that I get a chance to work with him. I am particularly excited about our theme this year, and I look forward to the open, important discussions that will take place over the coming days as we explore how we can harness technology and digital innovation to not only support and prepare, but truly empower our learners as they navigate an even more complex future. I was struck by Robert's opening remarks in which he said, and I believe he is so right, that supporting today's digital learners is so much more than online learning. TESS gives us a unique opportunity to bring together some of the most curious, knowledgeable, and innovative thinkers in the sector to focus on the role of technology in education and on the critical decisions we need to make today that will set us up for success tomorrow and beyond. And that is all of you. And if you haven't known in my past, I had an opportunity to actually be a leader of a distance education and learning technology unit at Memorial University. And so I have great affinity for the work that you do and just such great support for the work that you do every day. In the years prior to the pandemic, we all experienced the steady rise of technology as the enhancer in the delivery of relevant learner-centered learning and programming. During lockdown, we learned rapidly to use technology not only as an enhancer, but as a critical enabler in our collective effort to keep teaching and learning and our institutions moving forward through extremely difficult circumstances. Last year, I spoke about the heroic efforts of our people, many of them in the room today, to adapt and lead through the pandemic crisis, leveraging the benefit of technology in new ways. Now, here we are a year later, having witnessed a game-changing technological advances and significant new global pressures in our industries, society, and natural environment that require us to take our efforts to a whole new level. I know that, like me, you all recognize that continued incremental changes and in how we deliver education will not be enough to meet our current challenges, not to mention those ahead of us. There's a growing collective awareness that we must not only improve, but radically transform our educational paradigm. In this effort, the rapid advancements we are seeing in technology in areas such as generative AI, the metaverse, and quantum computing offer us new and viable opportunities to rethink our models and processes in service to our industries, our local and global communities, and most of all, our learners. As we launch into TESS 2023, I invite you, who are among our best thinkers and innovators, to collectively discuss, imagine, and co-create your new paradigm, or our new paradigm, one in which we go beyond thinking of technology as an enhancer and enabler, to considering how we can use technology to personalize learning and to do it at scale. This has always been our challenge as educators and a major barrier to innovation and teaching and learning. Today, we have the tools available to us, and I invite you to think about how these tools can help us individualize learning in new, meaningful, and scalable ways. This work is critical as we know that only through individualized approaches can we nurture each learner's full potential and so truly empower each learner. I invite you to join me in exploring how new technologies can help us reinvent our institutions to provide effective, equitable, and inclusive education for every learner at every stage of their journey, adapted to the learning they need, when, and how they need it. Richer and more immersive learning environments that reach all learners regardless of where they live through artificial intelligence and augmented reality, virtual reality. <coughs> Flexible learning options through stackables, micro-credentials, and modularized programming that provide maximum accurate recognition of prior learning and de deliver targeted and efficient up and reskilling. 
more extensive, impactful, experiential, and work-integrated learning for all learners that prepare them for success in the future of work. New and meaningful ways for faculty to connect with their students in rigorous, challenge, and competency-based environments with a continued focus on human-centered teaching and learning. Learning and working environments that foster health and well-being, ethical practices, and inclusive communities where each individual feels they belong. Learning and working environments that nurture digital access, fluency, and agency in every individual, faculty, staff, and student. We have a challenge ahead of us, but also a clear goal. One that is the leader of one of Canada's largest polytechnics, I am keenly aware of, to continue to into the future as strong, relevant institutions that provide the best possible experience for our learners. This is a time to be bold and courageous, to embrace the opportunities afforded by emerging technology and to make decisions that position us to empower every learner in ways we could not have conceived before, in curriculum and teaching and learning, but also in personalized student supports delivered comprehensively and in a dynamic, digitally enhanced connections to industry and research as an integral part of what we do as educational institutions. I know your efforts will continue to be heroic and I'm honored and excited to be on this journey with you. On behalf of my co-chair, Stephen Murphy and I, we would like to thank all members of the board that give their time, volunteer time and attention to guiding eCampus, and a special thanks to everyone that works at eCampus. They do incredible work each and every day, and I am proud to have expo be exposed to the work that they do. They're just exceptional people. And to each and every one of you, I think about your roles today and where they were three years ago, and you think about the expansive role and responsibility that, that we have. What I know about the work you do is that you are the change makers. You are the leaders, you're the innovators, you're the creative thinkers, and you are the people we really need to continue to lean on. So I wish you well over the next two days. I thank you for the opportunity for me to be here this morning, and I want to thank each and every one of you for taking your time to be engaged in these discussions and for the work that you do each and every day to transform the learning experience for our students. Thank you. It's so important to talk about learning in a digital context. Welcome to TESS 2023. I'm Stephen Murphy, the President and Vice Chancellor of Ontario Tech University. Coming to you from Hong Kong today with a real message that the entire world is empowered by technology. And it's all about tapping into the collective wisdom that you can find in each niche of the world. And I hope that as we begin to chart the course for where Canada takes its place in terms of empowering global learners, we also think about tapping into the expertise that we can find all over the world. People have been grappling with this central question of how to have good pedagogy and have an online experience. And one doesn't have to come at the cost of the other. I can tell you from a bustling metropolis where I see learning going on in the strangest of corners with people from Asia, from Europe, from North America, from South America, all together, it's a really, really exciting space to be. So have a wonderful conference and know that you couldn't be talking about anything more relevant. Thank you so much, Stephen, and also Anne-Marie. So if you haven't figured this out by now, my name is Chris McGrath, and I am the principal and founder of Coterie Education and Coaching Group, which means I discovered myself and I work for myself. Um, in my practice, I work with people in organizations who are committed to being better leaders for a better world. And that said, it is truly a pleasure to serve as your MC for our time together over the next few days, as I get to share space with people who strive to leverage technology as an enabler to amplify the transformational power of education. 
for the next few days, think of me like you're, maybe you're Oprah, maybe you're, you're Bob Barker, too soon? 99, a few days before his 100th birthday. He got close to 100 without going over. Anyway, so, um, oh, come on. Thank you. I tested that on one person this morning. They guaranteed they'd laugh. <clears throat> so besides getting out of the office for a few days and listening to my bad jokes, um, I have two questions for you. Why are you here? And what are you hoping to learn? Seriously, like, why are you here? <laughs> and what are you hoping to learn? I want to hear from you. Ravinder, why are you here? Mm-hmm. Right? Good. So Ravinder works in e-learning, wants to connect with institutions around accessibility and scalability. Pearl, why are you here today? So it feels like a hurricane watch, and so we're keeping our eyes on things so that we don't feel overwhelmed. Every, other people in the room were like, does he know my name? I'm only going with the people who I can actually see, given that I probably wore the wrong glasses today. Dempsey, why are you here today? Hi. Great. Here to learn from people and be part of transformation. So let's get into it. The theme for TEST this year is supporting the digitally empowered learner. And eCampus Ontario has been hosting TEST since 2015 and it's an opportunity for educators from across the province to come together and share what they've learned, to collaborate, and to co-create. And that said, I'm gonna take just a few moments to give you the lay of the land and a sense of what awaits you. The program for the next few days promises many opportunities to engage with new learning in multiple ways. And I'll direct you to the last two pages of the online program agenda on the website for a reference on a time-by-time -time basis of what's ahead of you. Our panels and our keynotes will take place in this space in the event hall, while the sessions and special presentations will be in two rooms on the lower level of this space. The Yoho and Nahani rooms are on the 16th floor, which is accessible by the stairs just beyond the registration desk or the elevators in the event hall. Breakout sessions for tests have been mapped into four learning tracks, experiential learning, the lifelong learner, transformative technology, and the digital balance. So if you're here with some specific goals in mind, one of those tracks may serve you well. Or if you're a risk taker and willing to throw caution to the wind, make a wild card pick and see what happens because you never know what's gonna come forward. Without a doubt, the sessions will be engaging in many ways, so be open and present for yourselves and our presenters today. And in those times, I encourage you to turn off your phones and focus on the opportunities ahead of you. Our breaks and our lunch will be served in the open area behind you, where you'll also find coffee and tea throughout the day. Restaurants are, or restaurants, restrooms, totally different things, are located <laughs> behind you as well, uh, just by the elevators to the right of the registration desk. During the breaks, please be sure to spend time with our vendors, WooClap, CDP Communications, um, Crowdmark, and also Voiced Radio, who will be streaming live from this event. Also, go to the photo booth. I've been told there's a photo booth. Please use the photo booth. Um, lots of fun to connect with folks who maybe you haven't seen in a while, and uh, you actually can provide proof that you're here. Um, following the afternoon sessions today, we will gather again in this uh, event space um, to do some networking. And I understand that at the end of a full day of learning, sometimes the prospect of networking and being social can feel daunting, and trust me, I know because I am wired as a complete introvert. I really am. And spending a day in different rooms with different people, my personal instinct is to escape and to unplug. Well, I encourage you to think about the opportunity differently. First of all, it's a beautiful day, but we're in downtown Toronto. And in case you haven't noticed, traffic is chaotic. Our transit system is under development. And um, if you rush out of here right away, chances are you're not gonna be going anywhere fast. Unless, of course, you somehow have access to teleporting or a drone taxi, then I would like to speak with you privately later. So at the end of the long day, take the time to pause and to share your experience with your new colleagues, and it really will be more invigorating than staring down Toronto's rush hour, um, because you never know what's gonna happen. 
I mean, at Tess a few years ago, I met my husband during the networking session. I actually didn't, sorry. I hope to, no. I can't read my own handwriting. Um, single, open to proposals. <laughs> my mother's in the lobby waiting for you. But um, joking aside, at the networking session, I actually did connect with a colleague. And we were talking a lot about what was going on and what we had learned in the sessions. And um, fast forward a few months later, and I was actually able to offer that colleague a new senior role at the institution I was working with at that time. So who knows? You might meet a new friend, um, maybe a new husband, or someone with whom you may share a meal this evening if you're here on your own could turn out to be one of your future colleagues. Um, so go to the networking session at 4.45. There will be refreshments, some surprises, and the photo booth. Okay, so is everybody ready to get started? <laughs> Weak. Oh, come on. Like, are you ready to get started? There you go. There you go. You're lucky I didn't make you do an icebreaker. So we're going to kick things off right away, and I'm going to uh, invite Chris Fernland, who's Program Manager for Projects and Innovation with eCampus Ontario, and our panel on improving employment outcomes for Canadian newcomers. Well, thank you, Chris. My name is Chris. <coughs> I have lost my voice the past couple days, so I might have some voice cracks. Apologies. It is my pleasure to introduce a group of panelists here to discuss the Facilitating Access to Skilled Trades, or the FAST program for short. We're going to discuss some strategies for meeting current and future labor market demands. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce, in no particular order, Mary Butler, President and CEO of the New Brunswick Community College. Fun fact about Mary, she was once a wrangler in Yellowstone National Park. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeehaw. Yeah. Also with us today is Patrick, Patrick McKenzie, the CEO of the Immigrant Employment Council of British Columbia. Patrick is from Vancouver. A fun fact about Patrick, he once drove in a motor pool in 1995 for the US State Department during the G7 summit for, in Halifax. Also more, pretty cool. It's more the stuff behind the scenes that was hilarious, but it would be embarrassing. Did you have a <laughs> former career in CSIS, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> also with us today is Tricia Williams, the Director of Research, Evaluation, and Knowledge Mobilization at the Future Skills Center. Tricia is based here in Burlington. Fun fact about Tricia is she once flew a plane over the Congo. I feel like that raises more questions than yeah. you <laughs> mining cobalt or something. My first, well, let me sit down here and test this mic. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Sit close. Sit Sounds close. good. So my first question is for Patrick. We know immigration is essential to Canada's economy, but so often new immigrants are faced with like higher rates of unemployment or underemployment in comparison to Canadian or domestic students, or citizens, really. So. Yeah. If you can shine a light, I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of the barriers that are facing new immigrants here in Canada. No, no, for sure. Uh, and I mean, it's a significant problem. So you look at it, 100% of the labor market growth right now is, you know, is attributed to immigration. By 2032, we figure 100% of population growth will also uh, come from immigration. So um, it, it's, a, it's a nut that we have to crack. Um, and, and it's one we've been talking about for a very long time. Uh, so roughly 50, 60 years, we've been talking about these barriers to, to full or meaningful labor market integration of, uh, of immigrants into the labor market. And, and it generally comes down to three particular barriers. One is sort of language barriers. So can the individual function in either English or French at a level necessary for the occupation? Uh, foreign credential recognition uh, is another significant one. Uh, and then a lack of Canadian experience. That one's a little bit more nebulous. You know, there's a lot more that you can unpack out of that. And, and over the decades, when we've asked these questions of both employers and immigrant job seekers, those are the three that keep coming up uh, from, from both groups. But one that I'd add to it, and it, I think fits with, but not quite perfectly with the lack of Canadian experience piece, is um, 
to the lack of networks so that newcomers who come to the country, they are not plugged into the networks the way we would be uh, as people who are born into the country and sort of born into the communities. And so uh, they're significant. Uh, so we've been trying to grapple with them for a very long time. Um, arguably, we may not be asking the right questions uh, of some of them uh, since decades later, and here we are. Thank you for sharing, Patrick. Yeah. So noting some of the challenges just identified, tell us about the FAST program. Sure thing. Yeah, so FAST, uh, it actually started out as uh, facilitating access to skilled trades, uh, and then we expanded, and so to, to skilled talent is the, the T now. Um, and I guess I just step back from the, the Immigrant Employment Council of British Columbia. We're a nonprofit. We, you know, we, as the name states, we're focused on BC, um, and but we're very much focused on employers and what do employers need. And we, we were created in about 2008, uh, and it was really in in response to the observation that there are so many organizations out there who are doing great work to get immigrants ready for the labor market, but who's getting the labor market ready for the immigrants? Who's helping employers understand that there is this? highly skilled talent pool, and, and I mean the numbers show it, uh, the immigrant population is generally much more highly educated than the Canadian population. Mm -hmm. um, so helping employers understand that yes, this talent pool exists, and here are some tools to, to access it, to really connect with it, and then hire and onboard uh, out of it. And so that's what we try to do. But we try to keep the employer at the center of everything that we do, and sort of looking at the employer as the ultimate gatekeeper, by and large, to employment. Outside of some of those regulated occupations, uh, clearly where there would still be a regulatory body um, in place, and so where the FAST program comes uh, from is a place of looking at sort of credential recognition, the foreign credential recognition problem, but as well as sort of this Canadian experience, the question of, of of a person not having Canadian experience, and so we started in the trades, and what we what we decided to do is work with employers, uh, work with the training institution. Uh, and also work with other partners in the, in the immigrant serving space to say, how do we get at skills? How do we get at what a person can tangibly do, help them understand how that lines up against what's required in a given occupation here in Canada, uh, and then give them a bit of a roadmap, help them understand you know, what could they tangibly do with the skills they have today? How might they find opportunities to upgrade to something you know, uh, perhaps a little more sophisticated in the future? Um, but give them the, uh, like empower them to understand how to create their own pathway here. So how to go and look for work that makes best use of the skills they have. You know, I use carpentry as the example. Uh, we, we started out sort of with, uh, with carpentry. And as you go through the system, you, know, you find out what you know versus what you don't uh, in terms of what a, a carpenter needs to know in Canada. But just because you don't have everything that a carpenter might need doesn't mean you have to go dig a ditch or drive a taxi unless those are the jobs you want to do. And so what we say is that you may not be a carpenter, but you know how to do a roof, you know how to lay floors, you know concrete, vertical formwork, horizontal formwork. These are the jobs you can do with that. You can be in the industry, you can earn as much money as possible uh, with the skills you have, recognizing sort of the dignity in the individual uh, that, uh, and, 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 and help them then just build that life that they want to do here and help employers get the people that they need. And then on the Canadian experience side of things, we have uh, a, a prepare for work in Canada piece, or building a prepare for work in New Brunswick as well, um, that really helps the individual understand what they're getting into. What does this job look like in Canada or in New Brunswick? Uh, what's the sector like? Uh, what are the expectations? And, and the angle that we took there is really we look at Canadian experience and we say we want, we're looking at it from the perspective of an employer that wants some assurance that the job seeker understands how the Canadian workplace functions. You know, how can they work well with their colleagues, with clients, and whatnot. And so, so we built out, you know, with the, with those sort of visions in mind. Thank you, Patrick. I'm curious if you can sort of highlight some of the core sort of tactical strategies that the FAST program sort of utilizes to combat some of these uh, issues raised. Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, we, I, I, use, I keep going back to carpentry as an example, but we do the, the skilled trades in IT and data services, biotechnology, uh, accounting and finance. Uh, we moved into seniors care uh, recently and, and, and culinary arts as well. Um, and so and again, to use the carpentry example, you know, if you want to be a carpenter in Canada, you have to go through level one uh, and pass all of level one, go to level two, then three, then four. And that doesn't make any intuitive sense to someone, like in terms of what's actually in there, unless you're from that system. Mm -hmm. 
And so we worked with BCIT, you know, they came up when Corey Wilson was uh, mentioned earlier today. Um, and you know, BCIT is a tremendous partner in getting this off the ground, but we also worked with the Industry Training Authority in, in British Columbia and, and some employers. We said, what are we actually trying to determine here? What are we, what are we actually sort of trying to figure out what people know in those levels? And so we broke the assessments down to an atomic level. And so imagine you take the jigsaw puzzle and you lay it all out. And we, instead of levels one, two, three, four, we did it thematically. So it was you know, concrete here, vertical form work here, you know, safety here, and, and we came up with 17 different theme areas. And so it helps a learner who's not, and I say a learner, it's, it, it helps someone who wants to work and, and already has some ability to demonstrate <laughs> uh, that they can do this work. Uh, it, it helps them just intuitively understand what they're, what they're working through. So they said, okay, flooring, I get this, I know what flooring is. You know, I know what stairs are, as opposed to assuming that they have to figure out sort of the, the shorthand of the Canadian system before they could ever enter into it. Right. And, and that's a significant barrier. You know, so we, we're, we're really doing our best to, to, to break that down. And, and you know, what we've seen, particularly in the IT and the biotech and the finance and accounting services, is that in particular those folks who were using the program before they came to Canada, because uh, it's all delivered online and it's, uh, it started out as a free arrival program, but we were seeing tremendous outcomes. Uh, we're seeing, you know, 65% of the users were finding a, uh, or people who completed the assessment, and it's a 30 to 40 hour assessment uh, online uh, to do this. Um, so 65% were finding a job in their field within four weeks of arrival. 85% uh, within eight weeks of arrival. Now keep in mind, this is a highly motivated, highly skilled population. Like these are folks who were gonna do well, you know, um, to begin with, but we've accelerated that. Um, and now, what we're looking at is the broader po Canadian population, but it's certainly in, in, in newcomers and temporary residents as well, and saying, okay, how do we make sure that they can access this? And how might we have to change the intervention to be more relevant to someone who might have been in Canada for five years? And so this matches it. Mm. Thanks for sharing, Patrick. Yeah. So you mentioned outcomes. I'm curious, like what have been some of your early signs of success, you know, sure. having sort of stewarded this program from the start? So uh, it was really promising. Uh, those, some of those metrics that I talked about, sort of pre-arrival, it's super promising right mm. off the bat. Uh, those results, but once you start opening up to a much broader population, those results change. Uh, and, and what we have been seeing is that completion rates have been you know, between 20 and 40 percent. So this is completely free, self-directed, online, um, and, and voluntary um, uh, uh, assessment. And, and my understanding, and folks in this room would probably know the numbers much better than me, but my understanding is that's significantly higher than what is typical for that type of online offering. What's, m I think, the, the, mo the strongest signals I've seen, though, is that we have over 60 service delivery partners across Canada who deliver this to newcomers from coast to coast. So we said we're a BC-based organization, but we had a tool that we thought would be useful for others. Um, and so we've given it away for them to use. And so, um, you know, the immigrant settlement sector, I always say we're doing God's work, but we do it with our elbows up. We don't like to cooperate very well. Uh, and, and we've cobbled together a network of 60 partners who want to cooperate with us on this. So it tells me that, you know, there's very positive signs there. And then we look into Brunswick and we have, you know, we have people who are responsible for creating the workforce of the future for a province. They're saying, we want this to be part of our solution. We want to help change systems here to, to recognize, to better recognize and better plug people into the labor market. Thank you for sharing, Patrick. <laughs> my next question is for Tricia. So uh, from my understanding, the Future Skill Center is like heavily focused on sort of strengthening Canada's skill development ecosystem, and really trying to provide lifelong learning opportunities for Canadians. So what's been your experience trying to sort of, uh, I guess, really improve employment outcomes? Thank you. It's, uh, I mean, I always love hearing Patrick talk about the relevance of SAS and how we're working on finding solutions. Like we're really laser focused on how do we find um, system solutions. So when I'm hearing you talk about, you know, collaboration, I think it's um, a lot of the problems we're talking about here have to do with the right connecting the right kind of information or connecting people with the right opportunities, making sure everyone has the right um, opportunity, you're not going to get that by just setting up one program, delivering that, focused on getting so many people through it. You know, it's really going to be thinking about how do the different pieces interact together. Mm -hmm. So certainly I think what we found at Future Skills Center, we're, I think, you know, almost at uh, four, four plus years into our mandate, 
and working with over 250 projects coast to coast to coast in Canada and really have found that it is that creative thinking and that willingness to push innovation and to try new things. They won't always work and it's really hard. It is really hard. Yeah. Most of the incentives are set up so that we won't collaborate with each other. Most of the existing things. So it's, I, I mean, I was really uh, struck by the call earlier in the opening about, you know, the, you're, the, you're the change makers, you're the leaders and thinking for those creative solutions. So I think we've certainly found that it's harder than we think, you know, and it requires a lot more creative thinking and willingness to lead and collaborate than, than we would have thought. But we're incredibly excited by what SAS is accomplishing. And I think you're seeing there, you know, not only that something is working in BC, but you're also seeing a made in BC solution that now is coming to New Brunswick, that's now coming to other places. And we are also thinking about the ways in which we can lead with that skills and knowledge base to really think about our whole integration system differently. Right, right. So I know eCampus has done lots of work with the Future School Center, you guys are doing great work, but I'm curious, like how has the FAST program accelerated your efforts at the Future School Center or supported your efforts? I think, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the volume of things we've worked with over the years, I think what we're really excited about is the opportunity for scale and systems change with SAS. And that's why I think we were, it was one of the first initiatives we invested in and it was that potential for scalability, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. So having the technology component be, you know, at, at the heart of it, but really at the heart of it, like I said, is thinking about incentives and how do you connect the players. So the tool is only one part of that. Right, it's thinking through how do, how do these things flow through a whole skilled system, and the tool is partly what enables that. So I think it's definitely informed our thinking of what's possible. And you know what? Not every solution has to come out of Quebec or Ontario. <laughs> you know, so I think. Um, Amen. Yeah. Um, very silent in this room, yeah. Ontario. <laughs> you know? You're speaking to the wrong audience. <laughs> no, but there, like, there'll be a hook any moment now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's uh, it really has informed our thinking about what's possible in terms of scaling. You know, you can, and you know, it goes with a lot of the issues I think that we're we're looking at facing skills in Canada. We think will not necessarily have broad-based solutions, right? The solutions are going to come from institutions, from different players pockets of innovation across the country. And certainly at Future Skills, we feel like our role is to help support and, and nurture that innovation. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. My next question is for Mary. I would, I guess, be remiss if I didn't congratulate you on the Celine Dion Thank campaign. You. From what I hear, you've raised close to $22 million from New yeah. Brunswickers to invest in new learners and really like the workforce of New Brunswick. So Thank you. Clearly be driving great change, so congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, so you are adopting FAST and implementing it into your systems. Uh, also, I think your francophone sister college is also adopting mm -hmm. FAST. The name escapes me, but uh, what was it that drew you to FAST? Okay. Um, thank you. Before I get started, I just want to say thank you to all of you for the opportunity to learn with you today. Um, and also to the tech team, seriously, could, could you think of anything harder than being at a digital conference and having your technology fail when you tested it and practiced it ahead of time. We've all been there, so yeah. a round of applause yeah. for Jeremy and the team <laughs> pulling it together yeah. and bringing it in. I was sweating bullets for them. You were great. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll try to make a long story short. Um, a, a few years ago, back seven years ago, we realized that um, our enrollment was stagnant and our domestic enrollment was declining. The only silver lining is it was declining at a lesser rate than the demographic shift and then the university who celebrated that with the college. Yeah. But that didn't mean it was okay. So we wanted to find out what's happening. And we realized that we were at a critical moment in New Brunswick. A third of our workforce was set to retire. We didn't have the people to backfill. Um, we had nearly half of our working age population with a high school diploma or less. There were plenty of people to serve. We just weren't reaching them. And we had, based on an OECD study, the highest percentage of jobs in Canada at risk of disruption due to automation and technological advancement. And if the pandemic, which was the hugest and most pervasive labor force disruption that we've seen in one fell swoop, we learned that the people who are impacted most are those 
with lower education, right? Women, our youth. And so we had a, a big job to do. And certainly we are a provincial, so we're different than Ontario in that we have a provincial mandate. Um, there are two publicly funded colleges in New Brunswick. There's NBCC and then Collège Communautaire de, de Nouveau-Brunswick. Please, Francophone colleagues, don't one, get it. Uh, I didn't even try. Don't so. tell Pierre how I said that. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, and we serve those populations. Um, so as provincial training providers, we knew that we had an important role to play in helping our um, businesses. 65% of them were having trouble expanding products or services because they simply didn't have the labor force to support their work. That's hard when you're trying to not only uh, stay alive, but thrive coming out of a pandemic. So our work was big. We knew, as Anne-Marie said, um, better than I'm going to say it here now, um, status quo wasn't going to serve us well going forward. We had to reach more learners than ever before, um, and that meant working in different ways. And you know, to Patrick's point, it's not only you know, immigrants and newcomers that sometimes don't have the, the network, but often if you're a first-generation learner, you don't have anyone around you that's been there, that's paved the road for you, that knows how to direct your path. And uh, so there are a lot of wraparound support services necessary if we're going to reach further um, into our domestic pool and support our immigrants and newcomers in accessing post-secondary education in Canada. Um, when we looked at that part of our population that had high school or less, we wanted to explore what the barriers were. And everybody was quick to say, oh, we know what they are. We know who these groups are that are underserved. We know what their barriers are. But I challenged our group to don't make assumptions. Let's get in there and find out. And when we looked at the group, we found three big barriers. One is preparatory, real or perceived, people who didn't feel like they had the skills to make it in post-secondary. The other was institutional. By George, we do our best every day, but don't we throw up some of the biggest barriers to entry that there ever was. Take prior learning and assessment recognition. We're trying to change the name. We haven't found anything snappy yet. But Looking at, as Patrick said, the skills and talents that people come to our institutions with, right? We make them enroll first, they go through this laborious process, we're very stingy about what we give credit for, and basically we want everybody to start at zero because we have a cohort assembly line, a cohort-based assembly line model that works well for us, right? We have to think about what works best for the person. And so that meant we had to break down some of our institutional barriers, whether we intended them to have that effect or not, they certainly were. Um, and then the last was occupational. And this is the one that blew my mind because it's so simple. People simply didn't know the jobs that were available and the pathway to get to them. Well, surely we can solve that. Surely we can do that. Um, so we started, we came up with this idea. Well, how far fetched is this? We're a publicly funded college. Let's be for every New Brunswicker. Let's ensure that every New Brunswicker has free access to a diagnostic tool that will let them know what their value is to the rest of the community, what they have to offer, and how that lines up to job opportunities available, right? Hey, I've got 50% of the skills necessary for that job, or 80% here. Wouldn't that have been great in the middle of the pandemic when you worked in hospitality and tourism for 20 years and found yourself at home without a job and you're thinking, this is all I know. I don't know anything else. But if someone had been able to map those skills and competencies, formal education, informal, and said, hey, Mary, you could have a job over here, here, or here. You're well suited based on managing people and budgets and events and all this sort of stuff for work in all these different sectors. Imagine the doors that would have opened for people. But we don't have those simple tools. And so a lot of people started over again at the, at the foundation. Um, I'm, I'm getting excited, so I'm losing my train of thought. Um, <laughs> anyway, so what it meant was we wanted to accelerate pathways to employment for people, to help our employers, to help the individuals, and we knew we had to innovate our programs and services in order to reach an unprecedented number of learners. So as we started socializing this concept of this free diagnostic assessment that would create those automatic pathways that would say, here are the employment prospects, if you have gaps, here's what they are and what training institution can provide them to you, um, people would be well on their way. And as we socialized this, it resonated with the, with the private sector. Employers were saying, yes, how quickly can you do this? Which we underestimated our ability to accomplish. 
And we were introduced to IECBC, and we said, hey, there's, there's this group out in BC that are doing something like this. Why don't you reach out to them? And Patrick and his team were great. They introduced us to facilitating um, access to skills talent, and we adopted, in it, we adopted it in the New Brunswick context. So we're in the midst of breaking down our institutional processes and um, barriers to welcome more learners. And FAST is one of the tools that we're using to do that. But, and creating that alignment between this point of entry to possibly post-secondary if that will meet your needs to get to that job or career that you want and to employers is our ultimate goal and we're still walking that journey. Thank you for sharing. You're obviously doing great work to transform New Brunswick's workforce. So I'm curious, like bringing this back to FAST, like what are some of your early signs of success and like how does that sort of fit with your mission to mm. transform the New Brunswick economy and its workforce? Thank you. Well, we're still in our early stages. We only have um, two programs on there so far uh, in French and in English. Uh, there are two more that are being translated now and then we have a couple of more trades and then some IT programs on the docket. Um, the good news is we've had 60 people go through and complete FAST to date, um, and they're working through our immigration services and are going to be placed with employers. The challenge is, of course, we're having to break down old systems and rebuild them to connect the dots between um, sector, skills and competencies by sector, um, mapping them to our curriculum and then to these assessments. And scalability is really important because people th think, great, what a fantastic door to go through. And if they open it and they only find, you know, two, two program areas or four, we're gonna leave a lot of people out. And so the ability to scale that across sectors um, and levels of learning is really key to the success of this. And so the more people we have, more institutions with the, the bandwidth and the desire to have that kind of systemic impact will really help us um, with that ability. I want to continue picking on you if that's okay. Uh, you mentioned scalability. I'm really curious. Like, do you have any advice for institutions here in Ontario that want to sort of promote a scaled implementation of a program, I guess, similar to FAST or FAST itself? Uh, collaboration. Collaboration is key. As as, um, as Trisha and and Patrick both said, you know, all too often, whether it's funding envelopes um, or things like that, that force us to compete. Um, we, we tend to work in silos, and heck, that happens even within our institutions. Get rid of silos. If we want to have social impact, not just economic, we all talk about our economic impact, that's terrific. What's your social impact? How are you helping people have better health and well-being and social outcomes, financial outcomes, supporting their families, contributing to the overall community? That's, that's what we're looking for, so collaboration is key. Look at it as, I, I know for our institution, People were afraid at the start that we were de-skilling, right, or we were lowering expectations. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, but it's about meeting people where they are, and you don't have to lower your standards. You don't have to change those things. You can still deliver high-quality programming and services to people. Um, that's where our integrity and our purpose and our passion comes from. Um, but at the same time, it's heavy work. And so right now, um, uh, we belong to a consortium called Atlantic Colleges Atlantique, um, and we have seven publicly funded institutions that deliver college programming in Atlantic Canada, and they are now coming on board. So that's new just within the last few months, but that's become our singular focus, is how can we scale this? Because we, we stand to gain more together than trying to unpick this alone. Um, and so we have to break down the silos so we can achieve that. Um, and, and again, I went back to the fear factor with our team. You know, the other piece of it was, um, good Lord, do you think it's a Monday for me? Pressure on the stage. Jet lag, <laughs> jet lag, <laughs> jet lag. I can't claim jet lag, it's less than two well, we hours. We have lots of time. <laughs> um, um, uh, I'll come back to it, I apologize. I was picking on you, so. That's okay. Patrick, and I guess, as well, I'd love to extend this question to you. Like, do you, from coming from British Columbia, like, have any advice for Ontario as a whole, for the province that want to really consider implementing a scaled implementation of a program like FAST? Well, I, I think I'd just pick up on, on what Mary was saying. Like, and, and this is something we really do. Uh, uh, we're very hopeful that we can accomplish in Atlantic Canada. 
Um, and, and for those of you who may have picked up on that, she's from Nova Scotia, uh, so I certainly have a, a soft spot for, for out there and, and, and the ability. Um, is to, if we're able to pull in these other institutions, and, and, and to Mary's point on scalability, it's then we can take in their programs as well, and it's that all votes will rise ultimately, and, and to the point of not, this isn't about dumbing things down, this isn't about lowering standards, it's about helping people navigate mm -hmm. uh, well. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, you know, giving individual job seekers the power to, to best navigate their own journey, um, but then helping employers remove those unnecessary barriers. Mm -hmm. you know? um, we work in a, in a mixture of regulated and unregulated occupations. Um, I, you know, credentials certainly matter, let's make no mistake. Um, but skills do too. And if you look at the if you look at the makeup of the labor market, 80% of the labor market's unregulated. You know, I say my job is my title is CEO. No one asked for a transcript. You know, no one asked for a credential. I just had to convince four people I could solve their problems. And this is what we want to do: is connect folks to be able to do that and equip folks to to, to be able to do that well. Um, you know, on the I guess in terms of advice to try and you know, to, to look at this, it's, it, it is really figure out the landscape, figure out the partners who are out there. There is no silver bullet. Um, like I, I'll make no bones about it. My ultimate goal with FAST is to fundamentally change Canada's immigration system and how the labor market works. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, my, that, like that's my blue sky goal. No big deal. Yeah, like it's, you know, <laughs> by, by Q3, uh, we should be all set. Uh, but it's like I, when I when I look at sort of the importance of immigration to the economy, when I look at um, at the uh, and the, at the scale of immigration, is that we have an opportunity to do something amazing, or to disappoint hundreds of thousands of people. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do as a country? And and so I see that partnerships like this, like I say, like NBCC is w way ahead of the curve on this as far as like and Grant. <laughs> I guess it's, it's our program, so no wonder I'm this excited about it. Uh, <laughs> I think she's brilliant uh, for doing this. But, it, it's, uh, <laughs> but it's, you know, it, it's, I don't believe that FAST is the silver bullet, the solution to all of this, but I think it's part of it. And I think that it's, it's about finding that coalition uh, of folks in your communities. And, 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 and the same in communities, like some, <laughs> some of our very best partners are not in what would normally have been defined our communities, right? Like, like I'm in Vancouver. Um, and, and, and being willing to, to assume nothing is sacred, right? It's like, if it's not working, we have to be honest about it and shift gears. This is one of the things I love about future skills is with their funding and their approach, um, they let you mess up. They let you get not something. Not too much, hopefully. Yeah, not too much. Yeah, not, yeah. <laughs> Did I not mention that? <laughs> uh, no, but they, they, they let you get things wrong, but they help you figure out the right direction and you try that. And, and so you can be a little more agile, but you need the partners uh, who will do that. And you need those partners to understand why they're there. Um, we've, you know, we've certainly had cases where you know, we've, we've signed an MOU with someone, they start delivering the program, we realize they actually don't understand what they're delivering. So we're getting the wrong clients coming through. It's not serving them or they're not bringing the right types of employers uh, into the conversation. So really important pieces to keep in mind. I did remember what I was, back. yeah, it did come back. Sometimes there's a fear that when we're, when we use the words transform um, our delivery models and things like that, that it, it does make people fearful and even a bit defensive because what we've done in Canada has worked really well, right? We serve hundreds of thousands of Canadians every year and that's a great thing and something to be celebrated. But think of all those that we aren't serving well. And so that's how I talk to our team about it is, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. This isn't about throwing away all of our success and the strong foundation that we have as a community college. It's building on that and it's augmenting it to, to add value and to create more on and off ramps um, for people so that they can you know, pursue lifelong learning. We love to talk about it, but we don't set up our institutions to make that easy. Yeah. And uh, so that's really where we try to overcome that fear. We're not, we're still going to have all of our full-time programs, and that works well for a lot of people. But we can't leave all of these behind. Yeah. And I, I wanted to pick up on a couple yeah. things that, like, I think we're talking about both looking, like, you have to absolutely know the micro issues, right? You need to know the skills and the programs and the jobs. You need to know all those details. And that's a lot of really hard grunt work, in a way like to, to get it right. 
but you absolutely have to be also thinking about the, the macro issue. You can't only pick one lane. You can't only be thinking about partnerships and you, 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 need, you need to bring both of those together. Um, more and more, I think, as we look at the, at the labor market, at the, the centrality of immigration, about our, our duty, our honor as a country, you know, that is composed of so many people of, you know, newcomer backgrounds that are just one or two generation removed with the, and, and our commitment to doing right by, by um, welcoming people to this country. Um, we have to we have to take this seriously, and I think I think we are not serving the needs of so many people. There, are, we know too much about how difficult and how unequal and how unjust the systems are right now to people. Um, that we have to figure out better ways of doing this. So I don't think it's just a matter. So if we think about scale, it's not just thinking, oh, let's add this program or let's tweak this. Like I think innovation at the margins will only get us so far. Fundamentally, we have to think about how do we connect people with the right opportunities, yeah. with the right recognition of what they already know, and how can they better signal that in the labor market to employers. So it's a bold vision. I'm with you, Patrick, on the bold vision. Well, and, and post-secondary is, especially today, is very uniquely placed to, 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 to fundamentally transform how this all works. If you look at the uh, you know, absolutely monumental rise in international students, uh, that have come into the country. Um, I think the last number was up, something like there's 900,000 international students you know, wow. across Canada. Um, it, that's a massive number. Uh, and not only is that number significant, what's more significant from a policy perspective is how many of those individuals then transition from temporary residence to permanent residency. So you are, you guys are the first faces that new Canadians are seeing, you know, potential new Canadians are seeing. And so what are we doing to make sure that these folks want to choose Canada, and I, you know, we're as Canadians, we're a bit smug, uh, you know, and we, you know, and, and for good reasons in, in some ways, but we, we are a smug population, um, and you know, we think, well, we're great. Of course, people will want to come here, and the, and the and the, the polling says they do. You know? uh, Gallup does polling every six seven years on intent to migrate or interest in migration. Um, the last number said 900 million people around the world are interested in moving to another country. Of those 900 million, 90 million said Canada interests them. And so I thought, huh, what can those 90 million people do? What could they do that we need them to do here? And then my next question was, why aren't the other 820 million talking about us? Not that we need 900 million people showing up here, but when we're talking about economic immigration, we want to pick the people who can come to grow the economy. I'm not talking about how we select refugees. I'm not talking about how we select for other reasons. I'm talking about economic reasons. And people who are coming as international students, we've got an opportunity to train them with a Canadian, Canadian credential, get them connected to Canadian communities, and have English or French uh, you know, as a, a strong foundation in those languages. So if you remember the barriers I talked about at the very beginning, like you guys can solve them. Uh, truly, and then build the country as we move forward. But we must give immigrants a reason to pick us before we get to pick them. And this is the, this when I talk about the smugness, we forget that part of it. We don't get to pick the immigrants unless they want us. And so we need to be really mindful about the story that we're selling, uh, and is it true? So the street, yeah. closing that down. I'd love to sort of pick on you as well. Um, Given your perspective at the Future Skills Center, like you've been doing lots of great work since, I think, the founding of the Future Skills Center, if I'm not mistaken. Um, like, what advice do you have to people in the room today that want to sort of implement a program such as that? Or like, wh where did they get started? I guess. Oh gosh, um, it's uh, it's hard work, but I think you know so much of like I'm I'm listening to Patrick and Mary, and I think you know both of you have shown a lot of leadership. Right, so um, I'm sure there are there are incredible leaders in this room who ha are able to build those those broker those connections, connect people, have a vision, and put that together. I do really believe that we need you know um, funding sources that allow us to be innovative, to try new things, um, and I think you know I'm <coughs> obviously very grateful for uh, the opportunity that the Future Skills center has with support from the federal government to support that kind of innovation and to support 
you know, things that we say, this may or may not work. We don't know, right? And, and we had a series of investments in SaaS where we were testing. We were saying, is this a solution? And it was on the basis of getting, you know, a, a really solid measurement and evidence generation that we were able to, you know, take the next step. And now we're, we're doing more testing as we scale and making sure that the outcomes are there. But we know that, that we do need some patient capital for social innovation in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the challenges we have in Canada, that we're not very patient, especially with that kind of social innovation capital. You know, so private sector knows this. They know that R&D budgets have a long time horizon, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 20 years. They have a little bit more patience yeah. in, in the capital. And so I think um, as much as we can in the institutions here, like have that longer term vision, know that you're not gonna see necessarily the results you're looking for in a year or two or in a single fun funding cycle. So you're gonna have to build that awareness with your funders and with your institutional leadership about how long, what is a realistic time frame? And I think there are amazing um, connection opportunities for around innovation, social innovation Canada and Colleges and Institutes Canada and eCampus Ontario has been such a leader in this too. So I think there are the, the connections that can help cultivate and nurture that. Thank you. I mean, everyone here has mentioned collaboration and sort of stakeholder management as like critical to the success of a program like that. But like what types of groups or stakeholders are essential to, uh, you know, supporting a program like that? I, I'm curious to pick on Mary in terms of getting that yeah. institutional lens. Well, for starters, it, it takes connecting the dots within our academic team, um, you know, between our learning designers, our registrar's office, and prior learning, experience right. education, our faculty. Um, there's a lot of people involved um, to sort of unlock mm. um, the mapping and that sort of thing. We have um, partnerships with multicultural associations and our multicultural council with New Brunswick, um, Opportunities New Brunswick, um, which looks at business support and attraction and that sort of stuff there, helping us connect with employers. Working in B is um, the agency that helps people who are um, not in the labor force or you know, in the labor force but not employed. And that's right, so we have multiple partners. We're even working with social development. You know, a few years ago when we were struggling with enrollment, I reached out and said, what are you doing? And lo and behold, they were targeting a group of youth who there's a gap in their service between when they're in care and when they become adults and have access to all kinds of other services. And they've been targeting not only that age group for that reason, because they're sort of in no man's land, um, but they usually are the result of multi-generational social dependence. And so they're targeting that group. And so we're working together with them on you know, career counseling and, and trying to um, look at access to post -age. So I think, you know, just think as big as you want, be as creative as you want um, in connecting those dots. Uh, one thing I will say to anybody that's already doing this work or considering, if you're doing it, then you know what I'm about to say. If you're not, like Michelle and Patrick are leading, we're, again, we haven't renamed PLAR yet, but they're calling it PLAR for everyone, right? They're experimenting with this. And they had their, uh, their first pilot in IT and they had results, but if I share them, then you guys might be like, oh, really, that was results? But they were so excited. They are so excited. They have purpose every day. They are solving one of the biggest puzzles they've ever had from a career perspective. They said like, this is just what drives me to come to work every day. They're so excited about the potential to unlock this and develop a new system that will see more New Brunswickers, more people access post-secondary that never would have before. So there's excitement in yeah. the failure and in the success because we are testing a new model, but it is possible. I mean, just look at the world around us. We don't have to do things the way we always have. Um, and we don't need to be late to the innovation party because I know a lot of the, the institutions that you represent in this room, you're already doing it. Look at the community-based programming we do. Look at the innovative ways that we find to tackle issues with some of the most vulnerable populations that we serve. We already do this. We just have to create the system so that they're not one-offs, but they're yeah. just the way that we operate. We're just an open door to everyone. Thank you. Uh, my next question is uh, on the same vein of sort of collaboration, whoever wants to respond. Um, like, could you shed some light on sort of the creative process that went behind of sort of engaging these stakeholders? And I'm sure people in the room would love to know, but like what type of approaches did you guys take to sort of engage these stakeholders? Whoever wants to go. 
Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just start about even the genesis of the program. I mean, the, the reality is we can only, we can really only work with the willing, right? So it's not, like when we look for an occupation that we want to get into, or a sector that we want to get into, we're looking for people who want to work with us. We need a, an institution, like a training institution that wants to work with us. You can't force people into this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's really about those conversations. It's about being in rooms like this and hearing somebody say something that resonates with you and seeing if you can continue the conversation. Uh, and generally they know more people than you do, right? And they're different people that they can, they can pull in. For sure. I mean, in, with NBCC, I was involved in a, in a group, it was like a cohort of immigrant serving organizations from coast to coast, and there was a guy in Fredericton that was on this group who happened to be in a conversation with Mary and Anne, and, and this is, and now here we are. Serendipitous. Right? Right, so it's, uh, I said, like, I never really had a plan in life, but this kind of worked. Um, and, uh, and, and, but if you're open, if you're having the conversation, you know, I said, my, my father, you could go anywhere and he knew somebody, right? And because he'd talk to anybody. Uh, and, and, and that was the, and that's the thing. I mean, just being willing to have the conversation, being interested in them, that's the, the best first step for this. Mm. I was talking with um, uh, a tech founder a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, the, the the, something that I think is very scarce in the world right now is curiosity. Mm -hmm. I thought it was such a, such a good comment. Oh, you know, being really curious about what people are doing, what's happening, asking questions, figuring it out. I was gonna joke too, like collaboration. Yes, at, the, at its heart is like, I try to hire people, obviously I hire a lot of Jada geeks, right? Like we love Jada, like hands up if you love Jada. I love Jada. Um, but, um, you know, you have to hire people and you have to have teams that, where people can talk to other people. And for anyone in the room who is, you know, doing frontline education delivery, you know, group work, group work. <laughs> they need to do group work because, we, you know, the, the real world is all about group work and group, you know, this, what we're talking about are big group projects, right? This is, this is a huge group project. And, um, so I think a lot of it is looking for those opportunities and looking for win-win scenarios, thinking about your stakeholder engagement. How do you align people's incentives so that they want to be at the table, so that they see the greater good as part of it? Um, and at its heart too, I think it's about solving problems, right? We've talked today about a big challenge around immigration, around skills recognition, our inclusive prosperity in Canada. And that is solving problems for individuals, for institutions, and for our society as a whole. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine people just talk like individuals and they get just more rampant post-pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys. I want to open up the floor to questions from the group. Uh, we have a mic runner, Mr. Kevin Fasola over here. First question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. And and thank you for, for, for these uh, this great comments and conversation. This question is specific for Patrick, because you opened um, your participation talking about barriers to, employ, to employment. You talk about language, and I think we can all appreciate how that becomes a, a barrier. You also talk about the lack of Canadian experience. You added lack of networks. Mm -hmm. But you also talk about foreign credential recognition. Can I probe you further? What is the problem with, with foreign credential recognition? Is it access to credential assessment? I, I think the problem is, is, is more pervasive than that. I mean, WES is just down the street, right? You can, you can get your credential assessed. As an immigrant coming in as a principal applicant in a federal skilled worker program, you must get your credential assessed. So assessments are available. But I go back to the question around employers and like the unregulated, uh, you know, unregulated jobs. Do employers care? Like employers use, I, I firmly believe, and I know I've done it myself, is that by and large employers are using credentials as a shorthand for ability. But, you know, but the credential doesn't actually tell you what you can do. Like uh, if I have a BA, it doesn't say what I can do, it just says I have a BA and that I could get through a program. Um, I went to Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax the people who interviewed They're me. They're wishing you had said more just now. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, but I, but like I, went, I went to university there. I got my, my BPR out there. And then I, you know, I applied for the job that I have now. The four board members who interviewed me never set foot on a campus at Mount St. Vincent University, but they have some faith in it. It's a Canadian university. They know what a Canadian university is like. So it's familiar. They don't know that you know, the Indian Institute of Technology is every bit as good as MIT. 
or, or you know, and so the employers are not equipped to do that. And keep in mind, this is not the fault of employers that they don't know what every educational institution is out there in the world. I mean, the bulk of jobs are in small to medium sized enterprises. Uh, Seventies, this might be a BC stat, not a national one, but it's like seventy six percent of jobs are in small to medium sized enterprises. 96% of businesses are small to medium sized enterprises. Like it, it, 90% they're just national. 90%, 90 of employment nationally is. Yeah, so it's like, it, it, no wonder they don't. Like, how could you possibly expect them to do it? And so, this is where I think if we can change the conversation around skills and tangible skills that someone can demonstrate, it becomes much easier to see how they can solve your problem as an employer. Now, if you need somebody to be you know, a PNG, if you need somebody to have an MD, like, that's clearly different. Right, like that's there's clearly there are those jobs where you must have a credential, um, but for the eighty percent of jobs that we don't, we I do believe we need to transform the thinking into skills uh, and ability, as opposed to using the using um, using credentials as a shorthand. It works well for people who are born and educated in Canada. <laughs> it doesn't work so well, and we see it. We, we absolutely see it, and, and, and it doesn't work well for those who aren't. Thank you for that response, Patrick. More questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Lissandra. I'm from Ontario Tech University. So the question I have, I was at a conference last week, and it was called Be Future 2023. It focused on um, black tech professionals or students and at that conference, the stress was more on exactly what you're talking about, transformative skills. My question is, how do we get the colleges and not so much the colleges, but the employer hiring students are, once they've graduated with transferable skills and not looking at three, four, five, six years of experience into jobs where they do have those transferable skills. So what message do you have going forward that maybe some of the institutions who are here in terms of utilizing that aspect of skills within, um, with partners? Good question. So one thing I'll say is that a lot of times there's assumption that someone coming out of a college or university is entry level and doesn't take into the fact that they might already have one or two degrees and may have had 10 years working in the finance industry and came back and reskilled and they're starting again. So again, it's looking at the whole person and the, uh, you know experience is a word um, that we're trying to bring into the prior learning uh, recognition because experience counts I mean look most of my education has been on the job let's I'm not young most of my education has been on the job at this point and so it's being able to to assess that give it some structure that someone recognizes um, and that that person can say here's the value I can add um, so I think that's part of the conversation is educating our employers and you're lucky if you have employers who can be that strict about their criteria, they're in a good spot compared to most who are just struggling to find not only people, but people with the right skills to do the jobs. Um, so education is a key and, and having them part of the conversation and using them as a validator um, is also helpful. I'd maybe just add on that, like we've done some research at Future Skills um, about the kinds of uh, requirements or skills that employers ask for in posting. And what we see is that they generally think they're looking for technical skills, right? So they might not say like that they're like looking for transformative skills, but it actually becomes a really important thing that they do want, but they don't really know how to like assess it. They don't know how to say, oh yes, this person has those skills that I need or even recognize it. So I do think we have some work to do. And some, a couple of the initiatives we're working on are for example, we're working with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce to help, you know, looking at these aggregation um, entities that can work with a whole bunch of small and medium enterprises to help also employers understand how their skills requirements and what they're looking for is changing. The same way that, you know, the colleges and institutions are going through tremendous change, I think there are a lot of employers out there who don't know what their skills requirements are, are going to be like five years from now. Things are changing so quickly on that side as well. We, um, well, it's funny, we, we developed a program a few years ago and we deliver it online. And it's sort of like fast. We've, we've given it out to roughly 50 partners across the country who use it as well. 
And, and it came from a conversation we were having with employers and with mentors. I said, we, you know, we see these mentees coming through. They've taken job training at immigrant serving organizations, but there's this unevenness to how ready they are. And so we asked the employers, we said, like, what makes you say no? Why would, what makes you say no to a candidate? Canadian born, immigrant, doesn't matter. And it basically came down to their ability to sell themselves in the interview. Right? It, was the, it was the, whether you call them skills for success, enabling skills, soft skills, whatever it is. Um, but you, you get my, kind of you get where I'm going with this, is that people need to understand how to present themselves um, to an employer in a way that resonates with the employer. Um, and so it's conversations with those employers to figure that out. Um, that, you know, I think that's the first step. Uh, and so when we developed the Ascend program, uh, we had a, a reference group of employers, we had a reference group of service delivery partners, uh, and, that, and, then, and then we had some immigrants as well who were helping us. And, uh, you know, it, and the idea was it must be content that resonates with the employer. It has to be something that can be delivered, uh, for one. Like you have the greatest content, you can't deliver it, it's useless. Uh, and you, know, you have great content, you have a, a delivery uh, system for it, but it makes no sense to the learner, well then it's useless. Uh, so we had to bring those three pieces in to, to make it work. And then what we saw, and just to pick up on, on an earlier sort of theme, uh, what, we're, what we're seeing now is in some of our other programs, the candidates who are coming through, the newcomers who are getting interviews, um, and this is very small data sets, like StatsCan would never tolerate, <laughs> tolerate this, but it's really more about looking for places to investigate further. We're seeing that, you know, of the people who, if you used our Ascend program, you were 80% more likely to get an interview uh, than someone who hadn't. You're roughly 70% more likely if you used a FAST program, you know, and then if you combine the two, it's even higher. So it's, we're looking for these little nuggets in it all as well to see, okay, what are, what's the secret sauce here? How do we, how do we get the right combination of interventions together? I hope that's, you had a question from Jenny Heyman, right? Cool. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the panel. I'm really enjoying the conversation, hearing a lot of similar questions to the one I have. Um, but I think a couple of things. I wonder how we as employers, we are employers, can change our own practices. Mm -hmm. uh, because typically our, our practice is to put folks through the behavioral interview, ask them questions. Uh, and I find many, many very uh, talented gems don't make it through that process, right? Not because they're not prepared, not because they're not educated, but because it's a weird way to, to seek new employees, right? We're very solid in that system. Uh, and I wonder how we might change employer behaviors through training, right? We're training institutions. How can we invite employers in, their HR departments in, to try and figure out how to find these hidden gems among folks who are applying, not the top cream, cream <laughs> of the education community experience folks, but those ones, those unexpected ones who would probably be really loyal, great employees. I, I love that question, and it gets at something you're talking about being a data geek. There's a, a future opportunity with this, um, if we get to this solution, that will be great. So it's changing behavior. I, we, we started, I said to our HR department, if we want employers to think about skills and competencies, that's how we need to advertise jobs. Yeah. So if you look for a job on MECC, and if you find one that doesn't follow this, please let me know. But um, we list the skills and competencies, right? And then it, it's nice if you have these qualifications or that sort of thing, as uh, Patrick said, some jobs you need specific skill sets. But we try to lead by example, and we talk to um, employers about this as well. Um, about looking for skills and competencies. So here's the, the future that will be so valuable to us. So right now, we, again, we respond to labor market needs with what? Programs, degrees, one year, two year, four year. We have boxes and we just go pick the size and we put it on the table, right? And a lot of our, our programs are developed based on lagging indicators or, or changed based on that. Um, we don't have a lot of leading indicators. Every now and then we get invited to the table when someone's coming and we can maybe, if we're lucky, get, again, a program, one of those big containers, up and going to coincide with the time that they need these people so they find employment. Those are the gems, but that's not the, the overall practice. If we really get this hub working and we get employers listing the skills and competencies they need and we're automatically assessing the skills and competencies of our workforce, 
all of a sudden we're going to have rich real-time data on the needs and the gaps. And we will be able to provide in-time training solutions to really help drive social and economic well-being and development in our provinces. That's where I think like the, the sweet spot in this is. It's going to take us a little while to get there, but that's what excites me yep. because that's real-time data, which we've never had on the labor market in terms of what's happening with those wanting to be employed and those needing people employed. That's why we have such a big skills mismatch. See, Chris is inching up the stairwell here at the ramp, so that's my <laughs> cue, but I want to thank you all for coming from all across Canada. So please join me in giving a round of applause to Patrick, thank Karen, and Chris. Once again, thanks, Chris, and thanks to our panelists as well. Uh,